you've been following Mickey's Miracles for any length of time, you understand that our top priority is getting infants and children to the highest level of care possible for urgent diagnosis and responsive treatment. But we also understand with the Mickey's Miracles and dealing with our families on a daily basis, and also with my journey with our daughter, Mickey, that the diagnosis is just the beginning of the journey, that this journey can take years to, to navigate. We have uncertainty, we have excitement, and, and I know that I've been really excited at times when um, we've had great results with Michaela, and we've also felt worry constantly. It just, the journey does not end, and that is why we are here, to share with parents what they can expect beyond the diagnosis. In this three-part series hosted by Mickey's Miracles and headlined by our Mickey's Miracles Medical Advisory Board member, Dr. Mary Zupont, now on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, she and also are, will be facilitating by myself and Daria Herrera, my colleague, a podcast in which we will do, we will highlight three main areas, medication, measurement and monitoring this is the where we will start and to join us to help facilitate this conversation we are so excited to have joining us mary duffy executive director of the danny did organization this nonprofit organization focuses on expanding awareness of epilepsy and sudden unexpected death in epilepsy also known as SUDEP, and fellow mama bear advocate and one of the most experienced mamas that I know, my friend, Colleen. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Welcome. I'd like, I'd like to thank, you, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dario. Yeah, we're excited. We, let's, start, let's start with you, Dr. Z. Um, when we started having conversations about this series in particular, you made a point that it was very important that we started with medication, measurement, and monitoring. Why did you feel that it was important to start there? Um, well, virtually all the children uh, who I take care of have, have epilepsy and all of them are on medication. And I know there's a lot of discussion among parents and in the news media about different anti-seizure medications, the pros, the cons, side effects. And parents are often worried about how is this medication going to affect my child's development? Is the cure worse than the epilepsy itself? So I, I thought it was a, a good starting point uh, because it's it's never static either. Sometimes medications yeah. change, new treatments arise, and it's a forever meandering path. And I think it's it's very challenging for uh, parents, for the children themselves and for us as providers, it it weighing all that and having a discussion is uh, probably preeminent in everybody's mind. Of course, and what do you feel? I know this is a broad question, but once a family gets a diagnosis, and that's that's saying something because as we know, there are a lot of families that we're working with that are undiagnosed. But once they do get that diagnosis, what can they expect? You mean the diagnosis of epilepsy or Correct. a specific, well, there's a diagnosis. To epilepsy. Yeah, the diagnosis of epilepsy is recurrent unprovoked seizures. So you can have a seizure due to a tumor or a, uh, let's say, electrolyte imbalance, like too low sodium, too high sodium, or due to an infection in the brain. But epilepsy itself is recurrent seizures unprovoked. And what I think is exciting right now is, okay, everyone wants to know, well, what's causing, what's causing these seizures? And before, oftentimes there'd be this 25 to 30% where we would say, well, we're not exactly sure. Sometimes you do an MRI scan, a brain image uh, that tells you and pinpoints an abnormality that we know can result in seizures. Sometimes we know that there is injury due to trauma or an infection, and we suspect that that's the area where the seizures are coming from. But now with the explosion of genetic testing, we have the capability of being able to locate 
a specific gene and gene abnormality that might be producing the seizures. And with that, if it's, let's say, Dravet syndrome, which is a sodium channelopathy, where the sodium channel creates a hyper, it, there's an abnormality that causes a hyper excitability that provokes or causes the seizures, then there is the uh, possibility that we can develop medications that target develop designer drugs, in other words, it helped to target and perhaps downregulate the sodium channel so that seizures aren't so prominent. So with genetic testing, to me, that isolates the specific abnormality that may be producing the seizures and gives us hope and promise for the development of new therapies. Amazing. Dr. Z, I have a follow-up for you. Uh, for parents at home that are listening in particular, it's not 100% that you guys, meaning pediatric epileptologists, prescribe medication and that works 100% of the time the first time. I know from Chris's experience, you know, Michaela herself failed, you know, seven, eight protocols uh, before they came to you. And, Nine and or you ten, but able... counting. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of them, right? <laughs> Um, and Pauline gets but, it. <laughs> but one of the things that I know, you know, Chris has advocated for is that she she didn't take no for an answer, and and she knew to keep pushing and to keep striving for you know a better resource, a higher resource, and that led them to you. So, what do you say for the parents at home that may not have like immediate success uh, with the first protocol, and and what does that look like, and what can you advise them on? Well, first of all, you have to make the appropriate diagnosis. And um, if we take infantile spasms, for example, oftentimes that diagnosis is missed. It's uh, chalked off to uh, what we call benign myoclonus of infancy or a start of what some people would call a moral response, or it's just a jittery baby, or it must be acid reflux. Those are a few missed diagnoses. And then with infantile spasms, some some providers are less comfortable using specific therapies. Um, and so even if you have the, been given the appropriate diagnosis, the, the best therapies may not be the ones that are offered to the parents. So yeah. I think first and foremost, you have to make the appropriate diagnosis. And if you make the appropriate diagnosis, typically there are medications that rise to the top that we know evidence-based medicine says these drugs have the best chance of working. Um, so it depends on the diagnosis, the level of comfort and expertise of the provider, and then the ability of the provider if things aren't working to say, you know, I think it's time to get a second opinion. And if they don't recommend that, that's where we, I think, should empower parents and care providers to seek out a second opinion if nothing else, to provide comfort to the family that everything's being done. Or maybe there'll be a different uh, treatment plan laid out. Um, if you choose, if you have a diagnosis of epilepsy and you choose an appropriate anti-seizure medication, the chances of that first medication working is somewhere between 60 to 70%. And if that first anti-seizure medication doesn't work, the chances of a second medication working is probably 10% or less, depending again on the epilepsy syndrome. And in a, in a young baby, in a child, it's really important to make the proper diagnosis and, the, and know the underlying cause. Because if you think of a baby, you think of a newborn baby, their brain when they're born, they're working on their brainstem. So if their brainstem look, is working fine, they can swallow, they have a root to suck, they move their arms and legs symmetrically, they don't see because they're the back part of the brain, the occiput where vision is, isn't well developed. So they're uh, basically working on their brainstem. Then between zero to two years of age, there's active connections, what we call synapses that are being developed there's programmed apoptosis, mean programmed cell death, because we're born with too many brain cells. And the brain is constantly uh, remolding itself and remodeling itself. And there's myelination that allows those electrical impulses to 
travel more rapidly. And so in the midst of this, all this activity that's happening in a baby's brain, if you have an electrical storm, which is what I call seizures, a sudden burst, synchronous burst of electrical activity, that disrupts this whole orchestrated ballet, if you will. And there is abnormal synaptogenesis. Abnormal connections are made. And the brain gets programmed for higher excitability and continued seizures and less inhi inhibition, if you will. So that's a so children are vulnerable to to epilepsy in a different way that adults are. We already have all our synapses and our brain connections, or the majority of them, um, and we can we can adapt to strokes and other. Uh, tr and trauma, but not to the same degree that a baby's brain can be uh, remolded. We, have, In other words, babies have great plasticity, the ability to compensate for injury, but the downside of that is they have greater vulnerability to the effects of epilepsy. Boy, do I understand that. I mean, we came to you, Dr. Z, we had failed 10 anti-seizure medications at that point, and when we first Mickey was three months old, the hospital that we were at actually got the diagnosis correct of infantile spasms. Correct. But then right. they, the, the two offerings that we had, they, they really pushed against one medication because as you mentioned, not only do I think doctors have a different way of approaching it, but isn't it true that hospital systems throughout our country attack different epilepsies differently as well? Like I've noticed over time, some hospitals may be more prone to doing the ketogenic diet or than, than another hospital. Can you explain that layout? Because it's, it's been very challenging for me to navigate it as a mom, also as the, the visionary founder of Mickey's Miracles, how are families supposed to navigate that? Maybe understanding a little bit of the background and your per perspective would be supportive. I don't think it's really hospitals that make those decisions. It's the physicians within those hospital systems that may develop protocols that they feel more comfortable with. Um, although I will tell you that there are cost variabilities to some of the anti-seizure medications that do uh, color and bias what a hospital would recommend or recommend to their physicians. So there is that bias, but it's really people who make Okay. makes the decisions. And some physicians may be more reluctant to go against what hospital administrators would like. Um, okay. Because really, hospital administrators would then be practicing medicine without a license, which I have had no problem in pointing that out to certain hospital administrators, that it's really up to the physicians to make these, make these decisions. And money may enter into the subject, but when we're talking about a great baby's brain, and a baby's future, I will be the most powerful advocate I can for what I think is right for that baby and that family. Um, so, uh, but I think there are definite biases depending on which institution you go to, but it's mainly predicated on the bias of certain physicians and or how they've been trained. Dr. That Z, I, I have a follow. I have a follow-up and I'd love for Colleen and, and Mary to weigh yes. in on this Let's question too. too. <laughs> uh, so you diagnose something correctly, you uh, prescribe a, a particular treatment protocol. So what next? So how do you know, other than the parents' observations of their child and the behavior, you know, what kind of tools, techniques, strategies, uh, technology are being employed to track the efficacy of that particular protocol. You know, we're now we're getting to like the measurement and monitoring part uh -huh. uh, of the conversation. So you've you made the right diagnosis. You've provided a specific uh, treatment plan. What's next? What what can a parent expect next? Well, every parent of every child I've ever taken care of <laughs> wants their child to be seizure free yes. and to have Amen. Uh, an improvement in their development, if not normal development. I mean, what parent wouldn't want that for their child? The way we monitor it, 
we certainly rely on parental reporting and giving us a good history. And that's why I love, I mean, it's difficult for parents. They're trying to juggle all these balls in the air. They're trying to make sure their child gets adequate food, uh, adequate sleep. They probably have other children that they have to manage. And if I ask them, oh, can you, do you mind keeping a seizure diary? That may be one step too much for some families. Yeah. Uh, but as much as possible, if they could, if they can't do that, which is completely understandable, if there's a specific time of day that they know that their child typically has seizures, if they can give me an idea of seizure frequency based on that, that's very helpful. And sometimes the seizures are very subtle or they occur only at night. Well, I'm not gonna expect any parent to stay up all night and watch their child. Good grief, the whole family will be sleep deprived. Um, but that's where we rely on video EEG monitoring, typically in hospital. You can do it at home, but the problem with in-home monitoring is sometimes the electrodes come off or there isn't, mm -hmm. great, um, there isn't great connection uh, because it's uncomfortable. So the child will pull off an electrode and you don't have an EEG tech there to replace it. Or the a specific event that you want captured, they're notoriously off camera, not due to anybody's fault. <laughs> I didn't capture that specific event. So when you do in-hospital monitoring, you can do it for a day or two and you get a very good idea. Are seizures controlled? Has the EEG background activity improved? Um, uh, do we see in between seizure discharges? All of that is really, really important um, to know if your treatment strategy is working. Mary, As you hear all we, of this, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, when you talk about sleep and monitoring, yeah. the first person I think about is Mary Duffy and the Danny Did organization. We send families directly to them because of your focus on SUDEP. Mary, can you tell us a little bit about SUDEP and Danny did and 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 how you really are tackling this area so so well? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Mary. I work here in Chicago for the Danny Did Foundation. Um, it's best to start with the story of Danny, and that is that he is uh, was my son's best friend and friends with his parents. And um, Danny was four years old and passed away from SUDEP, or Sudden Unexpected Death and Epilepsy. Um, at that time, um, his parents had not been told of the risk of SUDEP, and that really launched them into forming the foundation um, and kind of focusing on two major issues. One is raising awareness around SUDEP because they learned they were not alone and that other families had lost and um, were also in the dark, uh, had not had that conversation with the doctor. Um, and secondly, uh, Marianne wondered, what if there was something in the room that night, um, Danny passed during his sleep, and something that would have alerted the family and the caregivers um, to come to his aid. And so really that's our focus. Um, we have programs around awareness now, quite, do quite a lot, um, to increase the conversation, to encourage disclosure, um, in a um, in a in a doctor's office would be our, would be the first place. Of course, we'd mm -hmm. like to have it. Unfortunately, families will find it elsewhere, and you don't want them necessarily to be googling it alone um, at home. And then, in terms of the question about the technology, there was devices, and we found quite a few that um, help with not only monitoring but also alerting. So letting the caregiver know that the patient is um, having a seizure so they can come to uh, provide seizure first aid that might include rescue medications. Um, and to, it's really, we think of it as a, um, a complement, another tool mm -hmm. in their tool belt um, for whatever treatment plans they're using um, in terms of um, following, making sure that they still follow all protocol, all, you know, re reducing their seizures, um, avoiding their, by avoiding their tr triggers, taking their medication as directed, um, getting good sleep, um, not drinking alcohol, different things that, you know, they discuss in the doctor appointment um, in the home setting. They're not perfect. These devices are not perfect. We, we, they're, they're not the, they're not the answer to suit up. But again, um, the, Marianne says it best. She just wish she had a chance 
And um, that's what these monitors could provide, a um, chance to get into the bedroom and make sure that their little one is okay. Um, the monitoring, um, what we're in terms of, um, I'll get to alerting in a minute, but the monitoring has helped a lot of patients and doctors mm -hmm. with their communication and their conversations because they can often uh, and often do include video where you can review it the next day and send it to the physician for them to take a look at and say, hey, this looks, this presented a little bit different than in the past, or this was a little bit longer than we're used to, or maybe the, maybe the volume is increased or even decreased. We've told, we've had patients call and say, we thought she was seizing every night because that's what we discovered last year. And after watching the videos, they greatly reduced and their treatment plan was changed. The, um, the medications were reduced. So um, it kind of helps in both ways. Um, mm -hmm. So the devices that don't have video do have diaries can, that will let mm -hmm. them know when they upload the data, how long the seizure lasted. Um, some of them include respiratory and heart rate um, data that's following along the bottom of the video. So a lot of um, information that they might not think is that helpful, but when the, once the neurologist takes a look at it, says, you know, I can use this, I do appreciate this. And, and the biggest, um, I think everyone here understands is uh, you forget. Um, you forget to grab that pad of paper and write down what happened after a seizure. You're in the middle of a very scary situation um, and, and you're not thinking straight, oh, I better go grab a tablet and start writing this down. Um, or for patients themselves that might have memory issues and um, therefore they don't have to rely on that. They can upload their data from the, whatever device they're using. Pauline, you know a thing or two about that. Can, <laughs> oh, can, you, share, can you share about your experience with Owen and just share, share about your journey and I, all of this, I know we have had multiple discussions about um, monitoring Owen and, you know, working so hard. I mean, you've done, I think, every anti-seizure medication under the sun, um, yeah, we're getting there. including getting a VNS. So tell us about that journey and, and what has your experience been with monitoring um, Owen, especially at night? Sure, absolutely. I'd love to speak on that. Um, uh, you know, um, I... So, um, okay, well, I guess I'll start by talking about Owen a little bit, just to give a little background. Mm -hmm. um, again, my name's Colleen, my son's name, Owen. He is five years old and um, he, he's, you know, we've been on a long journey together with epilepsy, but at about five months old, he started with focal seizures. That evolved into kind of a late onset of infantile spasms around the age of two. Uh, from there, we eventually got the LGS epilepsy diagnosis. Mm -hmm. and um, he's, um, he's actually doing really great after going through a corpus callosotomy procedure and a VNS implant. Those were really big game changers for my son. It took a long time to get those treatments in place for him. Um, but we have about 90% seizure reduction with those two, uh, those two interventions. So that's been really amazing. Wow. Uh, what works well for Owen, we have a pretty typical baby monitor that we keep on him mm -hmm. at night. Um, I've got it cranked up as high as it can go. I sleep with it like four inches from my face. I'm not even kidding. And um, I can hear when his little foot rustles against the sheet. So that's about, you know, the level of um, sleep that us epilepsy parents are, are, are dealing with, especially those of us that are aware of SUDEP and, um, you know, live with that sort of fear. Uh yeah, so um, you fired off like 10 questions. Did I miss any? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a and follow And you gave up. them all back to me. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a follow up for you, Colleen. And, and let me say how much I admire you and your advocacy and how much you've really invested, not just in being a mom to Owen, but being someone who, you know, shares this transparently with the community so that they know what to expect, you know? And, and I would say my questions within that context is you know for the parent at home who's just getting started on this journey like share some tips if you can that they can kind of hold on to and so when it gets stuff which we know it will yeah, you know I can. what 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 kind of advice would you 
would you share with them? Or what kind of tips or, or, or any kind of insight you can share with them as they're beginning their journey here? Yeah, sure. Well, I really want to um, echo the things that, that Dr. Z pointed out about finding that appropriate diagnosis. You know, I talked to a lot of families whose kids had a couple of seizures and um, they're just being treated by sort of a, a run of the mill pediatrician and getting a, maybe a frontline drug or two, but the seizures are persisting. And, um, you know, sometimes if they're not seen by the right uh, program, it will take years and years before they get some of the more in-depth testing, like uh, the brain scans and the genetic testing. Um, I mean, we feel really blessed that we just happen to live in the exact same city as um, Chalk Children's Hospital. Uh, my son had his very first seizure and I just literally didn't hesitate. I was like, this is a seizure. I know this is serious. I wasn't going to mess around with trying to bring him to the pediatrician. Um, I just showed up at the Chalk ER and um, after a, a pretty terrible night, we just we were put right through the gamut. We did all the scans, all the genetic testing. Um, and that I think, I mean, in our case, unfortunately, we didn't really find any answers that way. But for the families that do, if you can get that sort of early intervention, uh, it's a game changer. Absolutely. And there's nothing that breaks my heart more than talking to families who whose kids go on um, having seizures for years and failing med after med, and they don't get seen by the um, appropriate program. So uh, that's why Mickey's Miracles mission is really important to me. And I think it's a really um, valuable resource. So the, the biggest you, piece you would offer, Colleen, is, is treat this like an emergency. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, and push for for the testing that I'm mentioning, the the scans um, mm -hmm. and the genetic testing. And if that's something your doctor doesn't feel is right, I mean, it's time to to try a second opinion. And I've I have told people before, like, if they are struggling to get those opinions, if they can't get to the right people, like, I mean, maybe <laughs> I just say go to the ER at your you know the hospital that has the level four. Just show up. I mean, that's what I tell parents, like, uh, because I think it's completely appropriate to do so. Yeah, I, I think you touch upon something that we advocate for very vociferously, and that's a level four epilepsy center. And yeah. I, I guess I, I like to have Dr. Zupons kind of weigh in on why you know a level four is the best place. Uh, and and secondly, you know, for that parent who isn't getting the answers at the pediatrician level or their local neurologist, you know, what can they do to get to a level four? You know, I know Colleen described you know what she did she just went to the er yeah, right? she's like listen i'm not leaving until you give me some answers here and i know colleen well enough to know that you know they they better have given her some answers but uh so doctors yeah i wonder if you can share some insight into you know why a level four and and what parents can do if if their if their efforts to get into a level four are being frustrated well level four epilepsy centers just that's a designation by the national association of epilepsy centers means it provides comprehensive epilepsy care, including epilepsy surgery, uh, which, by the way, is not a last resort for many, many children. It's, but it offers um, anti-seizure medication, investigational drug studies, which can be at the forefront for treatment. Let's, um, if you want to talk about the most recently approved drug like fenfluramine for Dervais syndrome and lennox gastro syndrome, Often level three and level four epilepsy centers offer, offer investigational drug studies, the vagal nerve stimulator. Um, you can have uh, in older children, 18 and over deep brain stimulation. And increasingly in level four epilepsy centers, there's a new uh, device, not, not for adults, but for children being piloted called the responsive nerve stimulator, which is like an internal brain defibrillator, if you will. It detects seizures as they're starting and then delivers a defibrillating pulse that stops the seizure on a dime. Yeah. So it offers well, lower we're excited form of for that, Dr. Z. Pardon me? We're excited for that, RNS. That's, yeah. that's all the buzz right now. That's the latest and greatest. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, it's very interesting because the first responsive nerve stimulator uh, or the, the prodrome for it was piloted on my patient at Columbia University. I believe it. In 19, oh my gosh, probably 19, right around 1998, Mar Dr. Marty Morell, who at that point was the adult uh, epilepsy program director. I was a pediatric epilepsy program director and some very um, 
intelligent electrical engineers were really involved in developing that device. So the hope is that it will be expanded, its efficacy will be expanded to the pediatric population. The only caveat there is your skull has to be thick enough to have the implantable defibrillator generator be implanted in the skull. That's, but you know, things like that are in evolution. So that's why I think a level four epilepsy center, if it's available and uh, to, the, to the family and to the parent is really, really important. Level three epilepsy centers offer the same services, but not uh, to the same degree. And oftentimes epilepsy surgery is not their, their focus. Uh, but getting back to your point, uh, Colleen, uh, that's why the Danny Did Foundation is so important because seizures occur at night. And we know the risk for SUDEP is greatest are nocturnal generalized tonic-clonic seizures often in the adolescent population, but we're learning more and more about SUDEP that, and, and, and it's so important, the most single most important thing to stop SUDEP is to get seizures under control. That would be the, the, the best way to do that. Um, but sometimes despite our best efforts, we can't completely control seizures. So the monitoring devices that both, both of you were talking about um, Mary, and, Mary and Colleen are important and at least tune parents into whether or not something unusual is happening at night that may increase the risk of, of SUDEP. And I applaud ongoing efforts to obtain more detailed data on, on the degree of seizures that are occurring at night and, and during the day. Um, just really, really important. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> I think you're on me. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Talking about beyond the diagnosis, here we have, thanks to you, Dr. Z, Mickey has been seizure-free for 10 years. We just celebrated last week. Can you Yay. believe she just turned 11? And we're so no. grateful for that. <laughs> However, we just did our annual long-term monitoring this summer at CHOC come to find out as we've known there's still activity in her frontal lobe spikes at night up to 50 spikes at night that if untreated if not being on for it not being on anti-seizure medication she could have seizures those could break through to be seizures so it just and now we're we're in a process of starting a new medication and titrating up a new medication for her to address that which i feel very grateful for but that really goes along how this diagnosis of epilepsy continues to be something that has to be monitored. And it's so important because we're really getting ahead of the curve and being able to make sure that we anticipate things going down the, the, down the road that we may have to experience, which is why having somebody at a level three or at a level four epilepsy center is so important. However, there are amazing child neurologists all over the country in rural areas. We have them on our medical advisory board that may not be at a level four or a level three epilepsy center, but are very, very capable of right. diagnosing and treating children. And we actually had an amazing experience where we have one of our um, doctors, one of our epileptologists in a rural uh, area here in Texas. And on our medical advisory board meeting, we open it up at the end and let these doctors communicate with one another. And in fact, they were that one of the patients of the doctor in, in rural Corpus Christi, Texas, had a 16 year old that was eligible for brain surgery, but they just couldn't make those connections to make that happen. And on the call, they ended up connecting with Cook Children's Hospital here in Fort Worth. And that, that, that young lady will be having epilepsy surgery because of that. So I think it's important to recognize, yes, that's the gold standard, but um, there are capable people and I think communicating and that's why having opportunities like this for all of us to talk and communicate and really connect is so vital. And I know you know that Colleen from just the Mama Bear Network and Papa Bear Network that we have out there of caretakers who communicate. And because of that, they're learning. Now there's 
also the caveat that we, you know, we don't want to um, go to Dr. Google. You know, we want to re rely on the medical professional, not the, the fellow mom and dad to diagnose and treat our kid. But I think the sharing of information is so critical to advancing where a child is in their in their journey with epilepsy because if they don't have the information they don't know to get to that higher level of care or to continue to pursue um to the the best degree that a child you know deserves they deserve to have answers ahead of time like mickey got this summer that wasn't an easy thing to hear as a parent but now i feel so comforted knowing that we're stopping something that could could happen down the road and in that Mary, what do you think you're, you're having this conversation, Mary Duffy, I should say, um, <laughs> we're having this conversation about um, families and monitoring these, these young children and, and providing um, nighttime ways to monitor these kids. What do families, what feedback do families have after they've received these machines or these different monitoring devices? What's the feedback you get from them from mm -hmm. a mental health and emotional right. perspective? Right. Well, the common phrase is peace of mind. Um, I hear that all the time. And that's not just mom and dad, to your point of families, it's siblings too. Um, mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're scared. You know, maybe they share a room or they hear things um, in the next room over. Uh, they worry about their brother and sister and nobody's sleeping. Um, and so oftentimes they say, you know, when, when we brought the monitor in the home and it was waking us up um, when a seizure was happening, um, everybody kind of, including the siblings, kind of relaxed a bit. Uh, just another layer in the household. Um, you know, of course, the best, the you know, the, the, you, you can't say enough about, you know, mom and dad, of course, being the, the number one monitor, but that's not possible. They doze off. They have to get some sleep here and there. And um, so peace of mind, the second piece of what I hear is independence, um, you know, as, as they grow up, um, become teens, especially, uh, they, they want their privacy, they want to shut the bedroom door. Um, so or they want to, you know, there's stories where the bathroom's door is not even closed. Um, so if they have a monitor, which there's a, I should mention, there's a couple of different ways to monitor one is in for nocturnal, which could be a video camera placed in the room, there's uh, uh, the company that Colleen mentioned, uh, High Pass, that makes the SAMI alert. Mm -hmm. um, there's MFIT, which is a mattress pad that's placed underneath the mattress um, and will pick up the repetitive motion. Um, there's one for non-movement that a lot of epilepsy families have really taken hold of called MIKU, M-I-K-U. And that is really started as a baby monitor and is marketed as such. But epilepsy parents said, wait, we can use this because it's going to pick up any type of sleep apnea, any breathing issues and sound an alarm as well. So maybe my little guy doesn't awesome. have movement with the seizures or they do have movement. But this is another tool, if you will. Um, and then but for the independence, there's uh, wearables where you m mainly wrist watches or bands mm -hmm. that you can wear that will pick up on motion and uh, most have quite a few features, including, including GPS. So let's say the teen wants to go to the park. Uh, maybe the answer before was no. Now mom says, go, go ahead and go to the park, bring your phone, bring your watch. I'll be alerted. Um, and if you don't pick up the phone, I'll have the GPS coordinates to get there. Um, so there's quite a few different ways to bring that independence into their lives where mom's kind of happy and the child's happy as well. And that goes into maybe even college, you know, that's mm -hmm. a very scary time for, for our foundation, especially, um, we, we, we worry so much about choices made during college and we just hope that, yeah. um, those teens are aware and, and brought into the conversation of what they are risking, not just a seizure, that there's more to this and to take this very seriously. If they make a decision to stay up too late to, you know, the different, make bad decisions, perhaps, um, including alcohol or, or beyond. So realizing that um, sometimes you, you, you do hear teens say, well, maybe I'll have a seizure tomorrow. Um, and, and they have to understand it, it could go beyond that. And so that they do need to take this very seriously. And again, maybe they get to go to college because they're monitored and mom feels a little bit closer, even though she's a state, you know, a couple states away. Um, 
I should mention that the Danny Did Foundation does provide grants for families in need. Um, technology, as we all know, can be quite expensive. And on top of the other um, bills um, that come with epilepsy, and um, we're able to um, have families fill out an application and a short interview um, to find the device that they need. Um, we do not endorse one over the other. We let the family decide which is the, the one that fits their seizures. Again, we know every family, even if you have the exact diagnosis, oftentimes the seizures are not the same. So right. um, the, each device is not the same either. And what, one might help one family and doesn't help another family. So we make sure that they have that conversation with their doctor, with um, whoever helps them make these type of decisions and selecting which device would fit for them, be a best best fit for them and their family and their situation. And then we go ahead and, and talk with them and try to help them with the financial needs behind that device so that they can get one in their home quickly. Um, so I think I got, to, uh, that was a long winded answer, but I yeah. think we we'll get to it. <laughs> we love no, it. It's, a, it's, it it's a great response. Mary, we were talking off camera that on your website, I believe that's Danny did foundation.org. There's simply, a page. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's simply Danny did.org. Um, okay. Our foundation is named after um uh, Danny's father wrote his obituary and the last line was, please go and enjoy your life. Danny did. Mm. And that became our namesake. So Danny that. did that work. Yeah. You mentioned oh. that you have uh, a list of some of the monitoring resources uh, that folks can go to with more specific information. Yes, that right? exactly. Right. There's a device page that they can click on um, a web page and they can find our application as well on that page. That's great. And then I think we're talking in terms of, monitoring and measurement, we're, we're really talking about two things, right? One is the day-to-day -day, uh, monitoring. And then the second is really the long-term monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. To basically track over time uh, how our protocol for treatment and medication is is helping with the seizure activity and, you know, basically giving uh, the care team information on a long-term. Dr. Z, can you kind of uh, speak into the, the long-term aspect of it. And, and I know, Chris, you've been through it, you know, for a while. I've been to a, a couple of those experiences with you and Gabe and Mickey. So I'd love to have Dr. Z kind of talk to that part of it and then hear your experience as a parent, because uh, it's been pretty uh, interesting to observe, you know. Well, for many families, their, their child is never going to be off anti-seizure medication, either because of an underlying malformation and how the brain was formed. And even with epilepsy surgery, oftentimes you can't remove the entire uh, cortical, what we call cortical dysplasia, abnormality that may be epileptogenic, but enough to stop the clinical seizures. And so monitoring uh, intermittent long-term video EEG monitoring may be very helpful in picking up seizures that aren't clinical, that are only electrographic. That means you see them on the EG, but there are no clinical uh, manifestations. So the intermittent monitoring over the years, much like Mickey is, has had, will change over time and may require different and new approaches to, to therapy. Um, so that's something that we don't advocate it have be done every single month, certainly, particularly in somebody who's been seizure free. But as that child grows and develops, their brain grows and developments, their brain grows and develops. And so the electrical activity may may change over time. And that's why the repeat monitoring is being done is to keep an eye on that change and see if different or alternative therapies may be most effective. Uh, or more more effective. Um, I think with one um, caveat I'd like to add to what Mary was talking about is in several of, of uh, uh, the families whose child becomes an adolescent, goes off to college or technical school, uh, I found that seizure dogs really uh, can be very, very helpful uh, in increasing the degree of independence for the young adult, because this seizure dogs, although I don't think they pick up the electrical activity, they're exquisitely sensitive to their owner. And they know when there are changes, subtle changes in behavior or prodromal features that may predict a seizure. So for example, one of my patients actually lived in the dorm room 
in her own room because very interestingly, her roommate didn't want to live with her because she had epilepsy. Mm. So she, you know, so here's another stigma she had to cope with. But for the seizure dog, when she did have a seizure in her dorm, the, that seizure dog knew to get the resident, uh, the, uh, the hall resident, and get help. And the parents were enormously comforted by the fact that she could walk around campus and that dog knew exactly what to do if uh, if that young adult had a seizure. So I think that's another, yet another layer that sometimes families, um, another way that families can approach it. So I just wanted to add that little bit, but. I'm so glad you did because the, not <laughs> only that, but the, the emotional support that, that those dogs, I've, I've watched them with, people living with epilepsy and it's a beautiful thing to see not only does it give them comfort in that way but it also just supports them in in navigating life knowing that they have their little best friend right there that they have their back when and if they have a seizure yes you have to like dogs <laughs> that's easy oh, a yeah. seizure cat i don't know about yeah. that <laughs> they have to be fed they have to be taken out but for many families that's been in on really they become part of the family and uh it's comforting to the siblings as well as to the child young adult who adolescent who has epilepsy i think it can add another layer of comfort so i just wanted to add that I should also add too that um, you know a lot of the tech, the technology. No company is going to say this is perfect and this is the answer right. to suit up. But what I'm, what makes me feel better is that they're. Um, you know, the community deserves better and there's a response to that. There is a pipeline of products um, coming um, and, and one right now that we looked at. Uh, Danny did often um, connects patients so that so these companies can get patient view while they're developing something, making sure that yeah. great, we develop this great product, but nobody wants to wear it. It's uncomfortable or it's not practical and, and whatnot. So we appreciate when they want patient view, um, but that they're looking at um, being able to predict. So wearing wearing something that would actually um, predict that's, that a seizure is coming so that you can get into a safe right. place, or, you know, do your seizure response. Um, protocols. So um, there's a, a couple different things out there. And um, we were part of something called Pipeline with the Epilepsy Foundation. They do a wonderful job um, encouraging and rewarding um, companies that want to get to market and um, an accelerator course too for those those types of companies. So I'm just encouraged that they want to do better and, and technology. I mean, that's the one thing about technology. It's always improving. So we're, we're anxious to see what's next. Yeah. It's exciting. Christy, I, I'd love for you to take off your CEO and visionary founder of Mickey's Miracles hat off and, and put on your mom of Mickey's hat on. And, and you know, Michaela, thankfully, you know, has been seizure free for 10 years. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you guys don't have a routine every year and literally every day. But in terms of the long term monitoring, you have a schedule that you guys follow. I'd love to yep. have you kind of speak into that, you know, as a parent, you know, what the, what's that been like for you? What's that been like for Mickey? What's that been like for home, for, for her siblings, you know, mm. and, and kind of talk about that experience a little bit more, because I think, you know, with what Dr. Z said that, you know, this, it, you often have children who, who will always have the threat of seizure activity. Um, so monitoring becomes a permanent part of their life almost, uh, you know, so I'd love to hear you guys are going on a decade now. So what's that experience yes. been like? And, and what can you share about that? You know? Well, thanks for asking that question. It was I was having flashbacks as Dr. Zipons was speaking. I, I should go back and for any of our viewers and listeners that don't know our story, Dr. Zupont saved our daughter Mickey's life. And um, because I'm I have my mom hat, I will be emotional. Um Mick, Mickey had failed over 10 anti-seizure medications and was deteriorating before our eyes until we got to Dr. Z at Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange County where she was formerly working. And I always said, Dr. Z doesn't do what's convenient, but she does what's best for the child. And that meant taking us out of our routine every three months for probably at least a year and a half to two years to go down and monitor her, which was so critical. And that 
doing that regular monitoring was a really helped us get met Mickey on the path that she needed to be to have the seizure freedom that she experiences. Then it moved to it just she just kept kind of pushing it out. Well, you could come, you know, in six months. And so what we would do is we kind we fly, you know, we were in Northern California at the time, going to Southern. We're now in Texas, and I fought like heck to make sure that I could still see Doctor Z um, and jump through insurance loopholes to to get back to California, and we still do to go to Chalk, and that moved it pushed out a little bit longer. And we would go in and we do a clinic visit, and then we would do long-term monitoring and do neuropsych evaluation and the neuropsych evaluations that we, we haven't talked about it were so critical in supporting her home team at, at her school i was sending these neuro neuro psychological evaluations there would be a full day of testing on michaela since she was this little thing until now and that information really helped us as her parents and her teachers and paraeducators at her school understand how Michaela thinks, how her brain works. She happens to have ADHD as well. And so we were able to constantly be on top of where she's at. As Dr. Zupons explained, her brain is changing and growing and developing. And so now we're at a place where we go once a year for long-term monitoring. However, as I mentioned, in August, we get this news that we really need to address these spikes up to 50 a night. And my understanding is, you know, at, at sleep time, it's so critical not only to stop the epilepsy and prevent SUDEP, but also that's when we're downloading all the information mm -hmm. we took in during the day. So we have double dose. We have Michaela ADHD, meaning that she has issues with attention. So during the day, if we don't have her attention under control, she's not taking in the information. And then if she's having spikes at night, that could affect her downloading the information, which all combines to her not being able to develop at the rate that she quite possibly is capable of. And I've always accepted um, Mickey has special needs, but I've never accepted and started Mickey's Miracles in understanding that parents, um, if they don't know, they can't do anything, which is the same thing that Mary and Danny did foundation does. They families didn't know it about SUDEP because many doctors weren't talking about it because it's uncomfortable to talk about. And now here we are, we're going to be going back to Orange County in January after we do this titrate of this new medication, take her down off her old medication, and then we'll do monitoring to see and make sure that those spikes are, are have been taken care of with this new medication. Um, we will go back next year for another neuropsych evaluation. And like I said, at this point, we'll just, just listen to what the doctor says and you know, take it a step at a time. Um, I think it's some very important also to recognize as we're talking about medications that we're also dealing with the side effects of medication. So this new medication Michaela is on, it's a very slow titrate because if it comes on too fast, there could actually be negative reactions. She could have a skin issue and some other issues. So we're also monitoring that. We also bring in her school team and let them know what's going on with her. Hey, listen, there's a new medication. Please be aware, there's, there's, these are the side effects that we're watching out for. We're increasing her ADHD medication. We have a Vanderbilt, so there's actually um, do, uh, a, a Vanderbilt assessment that they call it for ADHD that we're giving. I just sent an email to one of her teachers. I need that assessment back. You assess before and then, you know, in the middle and at the end as a child is increasing a medication and you really, I think the biggest learning that I have, and I think one of the reasons why we've been very successful with Michaela is that we really view everybody as a team member of Team Mickey. And that means her teacher, that means um, her neurologist, that means all her paraeducators, her all her therapists that are working with her. And because we inform them, we're educating them about epilepsy, we're educating them about Mi Michaela, and we're, as parents, we're always trying to get ahead of something that could happen. And I think the fear and worry never really goes away. 
um, you always, I'm always kind of thinking about it, but the, the longer spans I have, and then this is, you know, 10 years after her being seizure free, the longer spans we have, um, I do get more comforted, but I think it's just so critical to always have that what's next or in your mind or having those conversations with the medical team because that gives a parent comfort. I really got a lot of this from my husband who's former military. It's just ingrained in him. It was, okay, what's the game plan? What's the strategy? What are we going to do next? He you always say, Dr. Z, yes, ma'am. And um, yes, ma'am, as you wish. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we would do whatever she said. But that brought him and our family comfort in, in having a plan um, in place for her and for her team and getting all that input. And we've just gotten great results by, by kind of approaching it that way. I, I think now you guys see why I asked her to put her mama bear hat on. Uh, <laughs> that's my favorite Christy. You know, every version of her is great. Uh, mama bear Christy is the best. Thank you, you know? Dario. Uh, I appreciate and, that. And, it, and it's interesting you mentioned the neuropsych and how this impacts her education, because that's the topic for our second Mm -hmm. installment of beyond the diagnosis we're going to dive deeply into neuropsych evaluations and how they impact educational plans in particular ieps as yep. you know these infants become children these children become adolescents and so forth and and really on behalf of uh mickey's miracles and the families we are so honored to serve and who give us this incredible amount of trust to advocate on their behalf we want to thank you dr z colleen mary uh certainly christy uh, uh, our board of directors, uh, our entire staff at Mickey's Miracles, we're so grateful for, to, for the work that each of you do. Um, you're making a difference. We see it every single day. And like Chrissy said, it takes a team. And, right. and I am confident in saying like, this is a pretty, you know, badass team uh, <laughs> tackling on, you know, the, these difficult topics. So I want to thank you for taking the time uh, away from your day to share with us. And and to really help parents at home understand, you know, what they can expect, you know, beyond the diagnosis. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will end this episode of Beyond the Diagnosis from the Pediatric Epilepsy Podcast. Thanks for joining.